Welcome, everybody, to Traction Thursday here in the thriving metropolis of Fairfield, Iowa. Uh, Woohoo! Uh, my name is Alex Taylor. I'm the managing director for the Iowa Startup Accelerator Services based out of, uh, uh, based out of New Boco in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And we are dedicate, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to economic development through computer science education and technical education and entrepreneurship. And I'm here today representing the entrepreneurship side of that nonprofit venture. Uh, today at uh, Traction Thursday, the way the cadence works, we go through quick introductions so that the speaker knows who's in the audience and can uh, tailor any comments accordingly. Uh, after brief introductions, we will move directly to the speaker, and then uh, upon conclusion of the speaker, we will have questions and answers, and we will conclude today's presentation with community announcements. How's that sound? Sounds great, yeah. All right. So with that being said, we'll start with introductions. Great. Alex, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about an upcoming meeting and an update on the Southeast Iowa Food Web, not to be confused with the Southeast Iowa Food Hub, which Barbara's involved with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get confused routinely. Uh, so the, uh, the idea of the Southeast Iowa Food Web was born in Ken Meter's mind probably 40, 45 years ago, and he started to research how local food systems came together to create something that was more than simply farmers markets and home gardens and that kind of thing. And so he was actually, Ken was actually here in the early 2000s doing an evaluation of our county along with others. And I hadn't recalled that, but what I did have in my mind was we need something that is more robust than simply whatever happens to pop up in terms of local foods. The pandemic showed that, that we need resilience, we need additional supply chains, and we need, in a sense, to reestablish the infrastructure of the middle, because the middle has been hollowed out. You know, small seed dealers bought out by large seed dealers what, 90% reduction in family farms. So there's been a tremendous consolidation. So something organized needs to happen in order to move in the other direction. So I just started to read a Red Keds book, started to think about it, and together in consultation with um, Barbara and Faith and a number of other people, we conceived of the idea of taking nine counties in southeast Iowa, now 10, and just simply declaring that there's enough people here, about 100,000 people, to actually create something robust, to actually create a, an infrastructure of the middle that functions in a non-trivial way. And so we declared it. And what do you do when you declare it? You have a meeting so that for sure everyone knows about this thing. And we did that on the 10th of May. And it was an outstanding success. And we have been operating through the three priorities that were established, one of which was to do a needs assessment. And I'm very happy to say that that needs assessment is moving forward, that's the reason why Kellen is here with us, to talk about that. But I also wanted to touch on a couple of other things that I think personally are incredibly exciting to me. The first of the other things is the setting the table for all Iowans food plan. That Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong, but that has been in the conce conceiving and, and developing for at least three years. Yeah. It, and this is an effort that involves the Regents Universities, organizations like Practical Farmers of Iowa, very, very robust, more than 40 individual organizations and a lot of individuals involved with this. And the idea was very similar to the impulse behind the Southeast Iowa Food Web. If we're actually gonna have something other than the distance food system, where stuff just arrives at the store and where do you get food at the store? It's in, 
It's in cellophane, and that's the way food comes. If we're going to have anything different than that, we have to create it. And so that, I understand, was the impetus of the plan. I got involved relatively late in the game, but I was involved in the food and farm business chapter. There were nine chapters, and I'm delighted to say that the thing is published. And I did put it in the uh, Facebook notification, and I also believe in the email I sent out, but I'll make a much bigger deal of that. It is totally worth reading. It is a master plan for every aspect of building a food system, from equity to land to production to business to policy. It, it is just, it's been a huge honor to be part of that. So that's there. And you know, what is it? Goethe or Emerson or someone said, but start and help comes in uncommon hours. And that's what we're actually finding. Without naming names, there is a very, very significant regional player who is taking a very, very active interest in helping conceive what this food web would look like, not just because it's a great idea and it ought to be done. They're looking at it from the standpoint of their economic best interest. Because the big players, the Walmarts and the Costcos, are beginning to look at soil being played out, the need for regenerating soil, and the whole looped supply chain. And so representatives of this organization started posing the question in their mind, well, what about us? Where's our unique value proposition? Where do we as a robust regional player fit into this? So all I can say is that the, the conversations which are not coming from our side, the ideas aren't coming from our side, they're coming from their side, are just absolutely so enjoyable and so exciting. So that we'll, we'll see how that develops. Uh, there's many a slip, twixt, cup, and lip, but so far, really so good. So uh, what we'll do for this, so uh, before I uh, have Kellen come on, we are going to be doing another, oops, another Ignite meeting, Ignite 2.0, and everyone please put uh, July, Saturday, July 27th in their book. We'll be convening at probably nine in the morning and knocking off at 3.30 or so in the afternoon. Lunch will be served. Uh, it'll be a great meeting. Tara Johnson from Food Finance Institute is going to come and, um, and uh, facilitate for us. We will have representatives from the food plan, from the Iowa Food Coalition. Kellen and his team will be formally presenting the results of our uh, needs assessment. And hopefully this additional player will be there. And there'll be some presentations in the morning about these developments that have happened in the last year. And then for the balance of the day, it'll be us together inventing. Okay, based on this, based on this, based on this, what do we want it to look like? And I, I think it's just gonna be a fabulous day. So, Kellen, tell us about the status of the needs assessment. Sure. <clears throat> sure. So the needs assessment is essentially we're trying to figure out uh, what, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of services, products, those sorts of things are already here. And what do people want to see as part of a food system as we begin to, to journey, uh, to start our journey in this food web project uh, more formally. So we've built out the, there, there are really three things that need to be done when we're doing this. The first is we need uh, some sort of instrument, right, for conducting this needs assessment. So uh, that work is is wrapped up. We've had several rounds of review. We've had some great input from various different stakeholders, uh, some really good feedback from people in the area. Uh, but the the long and short of it is the instrument is broken into uh, really three different pieces. Uh, there's a piece dedicated to the producers, the people who grow and raise uh, crops, livestock, whatever it may be. Uh, the second is a, a category we call the market makers. These are 
aggregators, cold storage facilities, distributors, uh, maybe even value added producers who take uh, what what farmers make and turn it into something else before selling that. Um, and then the third piece is, are, are the consumers themselves. So all of us eat food uh, to stay alive. So we're all a consumer in a sense, but we're, we also are interested in those large scale institutions and organizations like school districts or prisons or uh, county facilities, those places where they need to provide food for uh, a, a large number of people, those purchasing agents uh, have opinions on what the food system should look like as well. So the first step there, instrument creation, what are the questions we're going to ask? Uh, what what, what kind of insights are we looking to derive from the, from the needs assessment? Uh, that workflow is all complete uh, as of today. The second piece is we got to get the the thing in front of people, right? We have to we have to get people to actually fill it out and give us their feedback, give us their information, uh, answer the questions that we're asking. So in in that effort, we've had a, a couple of different approaches there. Our main source of information is the Dun and Bradstreet records. We were able to find five thousand, nearly five thousand records across the ten counties uh, for people who fall into those three categories that I had just mentioned: the producers, the market makers. Uh, and then those large scale institutions that we would treat as as a consumer. Uh, so 5,000, um, if we get anywhere near a 20% a, a response rate, I, I think we'll actually eclipse that. Uh, that means we're, we're, we'll have nearly a thousand responses to work with, which would be a really, really great, really representative sample um, for us to draw inferences from. So from a statistical point of view, if you're doing polling of the, the for instance, the American population, a sample of 1500 uh, it would be pretty good for that you could you could consider that nationally representative so if we could get anywhere near a thousand or more responses from our from our needs assessment i'd feel confident in the results that we're producing so that that workflow is also uh, pretty much wrapped up we've got 5000 records from dun and bradstreet and then we're piecing in information we've received from chambers of commerce from rotary clubs from different organizations that are willing to pitch in and help um, but this is also where all of you come into play. Uh, once this goes live, there'll be an announcement and a link. The survey will live on a web page. You just have to click the link. It'll take you to the survey and you fill out your information. It'll screen you based on different questions, which category you fall into and which which battery of questions you'll be allowed to see. But ultimately, um, the more people who take it, the better. So if you know people who are interested in the outcome of the food web, who are a producer, a market maker, or who represent a large institution that does a lot of purchasing food, uh, those are the people we want to talk to and hear from. Um, so if you could pass along the survey link, that would be super helpful. I'm sure uh, Bob will help us uh, distribute that and, and get that notification out. And then the last piece, which we can't start on yet until we have data in hand, is all of the reporting out, uh, creating the fancy charts and graphs and PowerPoint presentations, which we'll share with you all on July 27th at the Ignite 2.0 meeting. Um, so that's kind of where we stand right now. Uh, we hope to, we're finishing up some programming of the survey. We had some really good feedback on that instrument. Some, a, a bunch of different people had given us some feedback on, on the questions we were asking and what to make sure uh, we were including in there. So we're just finishing incorporating that. And then we have to program it into the software that we use uh, and hope to be done with that by the end of this week and go live next week. So there should be some sort of announcement with the survey link uh, next week. That's all I have for you, Bob. Okay. Do we have any questions for Kellen or Bob? All right. Galen. Um, so how are you going to pick the kind of the, the businesses or the, the, um, food manufacturers that are kind of off radar, they're, they're startups, they're um, not part of the Chamber of Commerce, they're, how do you approach, because there are a lot of those businesses that could, when they're in recipe development early on, could be swayed towards a local uh, supplier initially. Uh, is your question, how do we contact them? How do you how do you find out about them? How will you find out about them, and um, how you contact them and include them not both in the survey and then in consideration for integrating into the food web? Right. Yeah. The only way to get in touch with them is through word of mouth. Right. So I can't if they don't have a business registration 
uh, through a service like Dun and Bradstreet, where I can go find them based on their EIN or whatever interaction they've had with government, which triggers a record to be created in that database. If they haven't done any of that and they're existing basically off the grid, under the radar, whatever analogy or or term or phrase you want to use there, uh, there's not much I can do other than word of mouth. So that's kind of where you all come in. Uh, if you know people who fall into that category, I do want to talk to them. I do want their voices represented in here. But if we're taking a systematic approach and, uh, right, I have to limit the amount of of time I spend uh, going through the phone book or whatever it may be uh, to try and find a response here or there. I have to have the, the bigger net approach of of grabbing the 5,000 records. So those people, yeah, they're they're likely going to have less of a say in this in this uh, needs assessment. So if those people those people's opinions do matter and they they should be reflected in here. But yeah, if you know of anybody who falls in that category, I don't have a way of contacting them if they're not registered as a business or um, you know a member of a chamber or whatever it may be. If if I can't see them on my radar, I can't give them a survey link. So if you can see them and you ca you can contact them, I need you to do that. Uh, you collectively in the room uh, and, and everybody you know. So uh, you're encouraging everybody in the room to begin making their list of those uh, far-flung uh, business contacts and uh, people who should be part of this. And, and Kellen, you have the ability to cross-check that list with yours to eliminate any duplicates. Yeah. But it would be better to over-communicate than under-communicate. Yes, over communicate. I want even if it, it does end up being a duplicate, that's fine. That's pretty easy uh, from, with the software we have these days to, to get rid of those duplicates. So yeah, I want those people, uh, but I don't have a way to systematically contact them. Hey, Kellen, tell us about the qualitative part of the analysis you're going to be doing. There will be the instrument, but you're not yeah, going to leave it in we're that. Gonna, yeah, as part of the sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You had something else, Bob. Nope. Okay. So the other part of this is the survey will ask, you know, if we could have permission to recontact these folks and reach out. So if we, we go back to grad school and, and survey methodology, uh, basically quantitative studies like this, where you have a survey and you translate that into numbers and mass, and we do all sorts of X percent believe this and so on and so forth. That's a very quantitative approach and you can get a breadth of information, right? So you can cover a large number of topics because the survey can ask a bunch of different questions. What a qualitative approach offers is depth. So we can drill into one or two or three of those topics. So once we get the needs assessment back, we'll be able to say, here's something interesting, here's something interesting, here's something interesting. These are the things we really wanna dive into. We also have made this list of people who said it's okay to contact them afterwards for follow-up interviews. Uh, and then we'll do uh, what we call focus groups. So a focus group is where you take you know, six, eight, 10, maybe more, uh, maybe split them into the three groups. We're talking about producers here. We're talking market makers here. We're talking consumers here. Uh, maybe it's a focus group based on those three groups. But at the end of the day, we'll use the survey question, the survey results to say, okay, we found some interesting threads to pull on. Let's go into these focus groups and pull on them and really spend an hour or two talking through those particular subjects. So in a sense, you get the survey that gives us some breadth of topics to 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 mull over and, and to uh, analyze. And then the qualitative approach lets us really dig in deep into one or more of those particular subjects. And that'll, that, that, that won't be ready for Ignite 2.0, but it will be shortly thereafter. So this is a question about <clears throat> the survey going out to end-use consumers, and uh, I'm sure that's a, that's a pretty heterogeneous group uh, consisting of many different needs. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about stratifying that population and uh, as well as how do you intend to reach them because they're such a diverse group? Well, the, I'll take the second part first. The, yeah, the second part in terms of intending to reach them, these are all organizations that are registered in some way, shape, or form, or are members of one of these one of these uh, membership organizations, like a chamber or a Rotary Club or whatever it may be. Um, but they end up on these business records by virtue of just existing as a registered business. Uh, that that's how we'll end up reaching them. The first part, though, is like stratifying. Um, so we asked different questions about them in terms of the size and scope, how many people they, sh they purchase food for uh, and feed and, and do this sort of thing. We asked them 
um, are you what what kind of con contractual engagements are in right so if we're talking to a school district they might have a they might have a contract in place that says they have to buy all their stuff from this one particular vendor uh, and that's a problem but we need to know that right we need to know to what extent school districts are locked into contracts like that and they can't participate uh, in a local food web even if they wanted to simply because of that contractual agreement that they're in um, so those are the kinds of things that we're we're really diving into. Um, and and we're going to ask them of all of those things. We're, we're we're trying to figure out how far do you have to travel? Where do you do you have to travel, or is it brought to you? Is it delivered from more than an hour away, more than ten miles away? What are we talking about here? Um, and then get into some of those motivational motivational questions as well. So if if you had a source that were much closer to your institution, would you consider switching from your current arrangement to purchasing more local food, especially if you could be guaranteed, you know, it's fresher, it's better, higher, higher quality, uh, these sorts of things. Price is going to be an important part of that as well. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, we are looking at all the various different motivations and needs of those consumers, because you're right, they, they are going to be dramatically different between a school district or a, a prison or a, uh, what, whatever it may be that we're talking about in this area, hotel, so on and so forth. So, Kellen, um, grocery, brick and mortar grocery stores are in this list, I assume. Yes. Okay. And hospitals are obviously all institutions yep. in this list. And then, what is the best format to get you a spreadsheet, just an Excel spreadsheet with um, contact info? Name of um, the entity. Oh, you mean for names number, of email? people that for you think need the to see too. the survey? Yes. Or should I just forward it to these people? Yeah, I would just forward it to the person. Um, if it's somebody who is a is somebody who if if we're talking about an organization that is registered, like they pay taxes or they're registered with the Secretary of State of Iowa or whatever it may be, uh, I probably already have their email. Uh, but if it's somebody who's not registered in some way or kind of under the under the radar a bit, a uh, local entrepreneur. Uh, whatever that might look like, um, yeah, just forwarding them the, the link would be would be fine because we'll we'll start the survey starts off by asking them identifying questions so we can we can track and make sure that we don't have any duplicates. And then, have you for farmer access? Have you gone through not just down in Bradstreet, but also maybe through Department of Agriculture to get information? Yes. Yep. We work we work heavily with the USDA on on not just this but a number of other projects as well. Good questions, Barb. Stuart. This may be stating the obvious, but it strikes me on the producer category that when it comes to local foods, we're talking about every farmer's market in this 10-county district, and I would venture that probably the majority of growers are not visible to your data set, Kellen. So our job, I think, needs to be organized outreach to each farmer's market with uh, contact because that is the local food production base that is probably not visible through this survey. Okay. So there's an Iowa directory of farmers markets that could be tapped as well, Kellen. Okay, other questions for Kellen or Bob? I question the July 27th date and you seeing a thousand responses between now and then. Is that real, realistic um, or yeah. do we need you, to do yeah, something? Yeah, usually when you send out a survey, most of the responses come in within the first 48 hours. People oh, get really? the email and they either do it or they don't. Got it. Okay. We'll know by the 27th what follow-up is going to be necessary to make sure we get to that thousand. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's give uh, Bob and Kellen a round. Great appreciation. That's awesome.